Thank you, uh, Working with uh, difficult crisis, I guess uh, I qualify as one of those. Um, but uh, you know, for a number of years, uh, John has done great work in putting some structures together. And there are many cases where the structure and what it provides is more important than the absolute dollars uh, for, for a victim. So this is going to be a, a key topic for us. Thanks, John. Thank you. Well, I couldn't think of a uh, better person to follow than Michael Slack, because his topic dovetails right into mine. Um, when it comes down to financial transitions, which uh, every single case that you work on is a financial transition, somebody is going to be getting, well, if the defense people do their job, they might not be getting a lot of money, but uh, people are going to be getting a amount of money which is considered a sudden money event. And then these people are expected to make a life impacting decision, often with very little information, in a very short period of time. Financial transitions themselves are extremely stressful. And when somebody is going through a stressful period, uh, this has a cognitive impact on them. It tempo temporarily dilutes some of their life skills and some, some things that they might be able to make quick decisions on, they're just not able to because of, of mental blocks. So nevertheless, despite these, these mental blocks, there are critical conversations that have to be had. Uh, for those plaintiff attorneys in the room, you've got a great recovery and you'd like to move on, you'd like to get paid, you'd like to do a good job for your client. How do you get there? The same thing for the defense, you settle the case, if it takes six or seven months to achieve final resolution, that's not going to help either. So I'm going to spend the next uh, 20 minutes or so talking to you about uh, some of the things that I've learned. Uh, I recently became a part of a, a group of elite financial advisors called the Sudden Money Institute, and that a group has been around for about 12 years, and the group exists uh, to study the emotional and uh, cognitive aspects of financial decision making. We've all seen uh, the 9-11 uh, widow who blew through $5 million in a short period of time. Uh, Eddie Murphy's wife uh, blew $15 million of a divorce settlement. Uh, there was a, a, a publication in Business Insider of 20 lottery winners who who blew it all, uh, including uh, a uh, lot, this guy Bud Post, some of, any of you from Pennsylvania, there, he was a guy who won $16.2 million in the Pennsylvania lottery in 1988. Um, he got screwed by a bunch of financial advisors, got a big settlement, and he lost that too. Um, so why does this type of stuff happen? That's what we're going to explore. Um, what we have done with the Sudden Money Institute and uh, you know, also there's other people in my industry have, have also been part of this project, is to try to develop uh, different types of communication tools. Oftentimes I get a call uh, from an attorney and said, look, um, I'd like to do a structured settlement. Well, many of you, some of you here in the room may be surprised that structured settlements are not all that we do. We actually do full service financial planning. Uh, we do, uh, we advise people about different types of trusts. We help people integrate uh, but comprehensive financial solutions that may or may not include a structured settlement. But again, if a person has to make uh, critical decisions with limited information in a limited period of time, they may have already spent the money, um, they may have already got financial commitments from relatives and other hangers on. Uh, you, you know that every plaintiff is different. Anybody here who's tried cases or worked with plaintiffs, every plaintiff is different. So. The key concept uh, that I would like to get across first is that there are two sides to financial decisions. Um, there's the technical and there's the personal. And when you're dealing with somebody who is in a sudden money situation, again, whether it's an air crash victim, somebody who has suffered a serious physical injury, their child or loved one has suffered a physical injury, or whether you won the lottery, you're an athlete who got a contract, or you're, a, you're somebody who's, set, who's uh, retiring or uh, you got fired and, and, and took a, a package. Uh, these all apply, the technical and the personal. And I can, I'm now going to just roll a video that uh, illustrates uh, the personal side of things. I think you'll enjoy it. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me. And 
I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless and I don't know if it's gonna stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever gonna stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there... Stop would... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing... You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, out. you're not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just... Sometimes it's like there's this achy... I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. Yeah, I, that sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on. Ow. If you would just... Don't! Try to see things my way. Do I have to keep on talking to... Get me back to the... Okay. Okay, so it, it's not just about the nail. Um, now, when you go... What, what typically happens with a lot of financial advisors, they come in with uh, a solution before they even know what the problem is. Whether it's, hey, here's, a, here's uh, my client, uh, there's going to be about... He's going to get a million dollar settlement, uh, run a bunch of structure proposals for $500,000. Now, in some cases, it works. But you have to know what, where the person is. And what, I'm, what I've got here on the screen here is the uh, stages of transition that, that people go through. And this can apply really to any situation, whether it's a death, loss of a job, a contract, that type of thing. There's, um, there's an anticipation. Uh, of something happening, or, or, or this anticipation of a change. Someone's spouse is dying of cancer. Um, somebody uh, is concerned about losing their job. Somebody is in a contract negotiation. Um, somebody's, uh, somebody was hurt in an air crash, and uh, there's a question of what their life is going to be like in the future. Uh, that's the anticipation. With every, there is always going to be an ending. Now, when you have an air crash, there's, there's that ending, there's the air crash. The important period is the passage period. And in most of the time, when you get somebody, they're in that passage period. And as you can see, the arrows are going off in a bunch of different directions. Sometimes they're going forward towards the eventual new normal. Sometimes people regress. And very often, people regress because of the stress involved with the transition that they're going through. If you don't know where your client is, or if you're a financial advisor giving advice, you don't know where that person is, it's going to be very difficult to get to where you want to go or where they want to go. And what I've found since I've been using this chart, and I actually have a sort of like a, uh, like a placemat on a placemat, and I try to give, I basically put it in front of somebody and I say, look, where do you think you are on this chart? Now, um, I have happened to uh, work on a number of cases with 9-11 um, widows with um, Jim Kreinler's firm, of attorneys at Jim Kreinler's firm. And I found it fascinating that some widows were, okay, sure, you know, whatever. Uh, you know, they were very, you know, they had their financial advisor there or a family member, and they were, you know, kind of very, kind of sanguine with the whole thing. And they were sad that they lost their spouse, but they, they were ready to move on. And yet there were other widows who I cried with on the phone because their they were so paralyzed because their husband made all the decisions, the financial decisions, and the thing that set them off, something just, you know, if you didn't know the background, you'd think it was ridiculous. What set them off was, I'm a bad mother because I can't decide whether my kid should get a lump sum at 22 or 23. And, you know, that's the kind of stuff you're working with. Every single person is different. Their orientation is different. And 
if you're operating and trying to do a cookie cutter job as a financial advisor or even as an attorney introducing somebody to a financial concept, um, the level of satisfaction is not going to be there. So this is a, 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 not a new concept, but it's a new concept that I'm introducing into the settlement space to help people make better decisions and to hopefully increase uh, the level of client satisfaction. Now, what's very, very important, and for all the defense attorneys in the room here, is what this is, this is addressed to you, is that when you're crafting together settlement offers, um, typically what happens is, you know, there, there could be a, just an out, what you think is an outrageous demand, which you have to respond to with an equally uh, perceived by the other side outrageous offer. And so what ends up happening, you spend, you know, a, a long period, and again, we're assuming it's a liability case. We're not assuming that there's liability issues. So what ends up happening is if the plaintiff is there, um, they start getting angry. They're already in a stressful environment. They're already in that passage phase, or possibly they're not, they're in, they could be in one of the earlier phases, and they're, you're just adding to their stress. Okay, now that's your, I mean, your job is, is to, represent your, to represent your client, so we're not, nobody's faulting you, but what I'm saying is perhaps there's a better way where with your offers you can help the plaintiff visualize or, or create a building block to a new normal. And let me just give you an example of how that works. So instead of saying, uh, I, I mean, I see, you know, some insurance companies try to shove structures down a plaintiff's throats. And instead of saying, you know, you know, twenty thousand dollars. I had a case recently where somebody contacted me because an insurance company had said the case is settling for one point three, and you have to structure fifty thousand uh, dollars. The individual's uh, uh, sister was a, a Wall Street person, you know, highly scholarly Wall Street person. Um, she was sophisticated herself. It made absolutely no sense in the world. However, let's say you take another situation where somebody has lost their job and they have no ability to work because of their injury or, or less mobile. So instead, how about coming in with an offer and saying, we're going to replace your salary. And that's your opening, I mean, assuming you have a liability case, that's your opening offer. We're going to replace your salary. And we're going to, now it could very well be that it's funded with the structure, but we're going to replace your salary. That's something that person can, can actually chew on and visualize and say I'm getting close to being made whole. If you if you were to t if let's say that that cost uh, eight hundred thousand dollars, if you offered eight hundred thousand dollars, it just sounds like you know against a forty million dollar demand or against a five million dollar demand, it doesn't sound like anything. But if you can help them visualize a new normal by create by by bringing somebody in to triage the triage the information that you have you can make better settlement offers and perhaps make the settlement negotiations more productive when you have liability cases. So this particular chart can be used uh, to analyze where a person is. On the plaintiff side, obviously, you're going to have more access to the plaintiff. And I encourage uh, people to bring in somebody with transition expertise early on, even as much as you know, three or four months before a case settles. Bringing somebody in with transition expertise uh, is not, does not give a plaintiff unreasonable expectations. When I first started in the business and I talked to people about bringing somebody in early, that's they said, well, I don't want to raise the person's expectations. But what you're doing is by bringing somebody in early and going through some of the transition exercises, and there's many more that we have that I could share with you personally because I only have you know, 20 or 25 minutes to speak. Uh, but Getting the person orientated towards a life impacting decision they're going to make at some point in the future is a tremendously, uh, it it's, it's really paves the way to a more happy client, at least from what I've experienced in the cases that I've worked on. These are some of the characteristics of, of transition stress. And uh, I sometimes place this chart in front of people that I'm meeting for the first time to gauge where they are. Because again, on that chart, they may not be able to quickly grasp, say, where they are, but it could be somebody there in terms of their confused. I mean, some of these are just obvious, but um, the persona is confused, they're uh, overwhelmed, um, 
the decision making is really key. They make fear-based decisions, fragmented decisions. They're either frozen, they can't make any decisions. Uh, they avoid making decisions for whatever reason. Just I just want to crawl into my bunker, so to speak. Uh, they have a very narrow focus. Uh, the behavior, uh, you know, they, they have exhibit victim behaviors. They're angry. They're they're withdrawal. Their behavior is inconsistent. Anything could possibly happen. And the goal of the work that I, I'm trying to do and the people like me are trying to do is to have transition success so people feel confident in the decisions that they're making and there's long-term satisfaction. And long-term satisfaction of your clients uh, means more business. This is a, a, a true feeling uh, of a widow. Uh, this was uh, published, a woman by the name of Charlotte, uh, Charlotte Rozek. And, uh, you know, we, like I said, I gave you the examples of the athlete. I mean, all the sensational headlines of whoever blew their money on whatever they blew their money on. But this is a real story of somebody who's a widow. And, it, and I'm just going to read it. You can read it yourself. But she says, I spend most of my days in the bereavement bunker. That's what I call the uh, place I rented. After my husband died, I uh, navigated through the many stages of grief. The first one is the merciful one, numbness, the stage which one makes idiotic decisions, like selling the place you live in without having any sort of a plan where you might go. And she goes on and talks about other decisions that she makes. This is a very real situation. This is not even somebody who got a physical injury settlement. Everybody who goes through a transition goes through some things, something like this. But if you are working with people and you don't have an understanding of where they are, it's, you're going to be less productive. So in terms of uh, financial advice, uh, what I'd like to introduce you the concept of the differences between traditional financial advisors and uh, financial transitionists, because I believe in the space that we operate in, somebody who has expertise in both is optimal. Uh, typically, a traditional advisor looks at the technical side of things. Now, as Mike talked about with uh, dealing with a jury, I mean, if you go start talking to somebody about uh, you know, a, an annuity that has a, a confinement doubler and a, you know, a, an indexed annuity that has a roll-up that does this and that and everything else, they're going to glaze right over. Uh, you might be technically adept, but if you can't break down these complex concepts into something that's simple that people can understand, even people very simple, uh, there's going to be, they're not going to be very happy. People who are financial transitionists or trained in financial transitions are adaptive, okay? And they're, they're trained in adaptive changes. Uh, traditional advisors are experts. Um, I personally am recognized as a national authority on structured settlements. But people who are financial transitionists, we introduce the concept of a thinking partner because decisions are, well, you know, on the traditional side, you've got predictable. You say, oh, the person's going to retire. The, the work life expectancy is this. But when you're dealing with financial transitions, the timelines are often unpredictable. So the person who is going through the transition needs somebody who's a thinking partner, somebody who has financial tools to, or, or psychological and emotional tools to help them explore things. Now, this, that's the reason why I said you need to prepare people beforehand. You could do this after you settle your case, but it's going to take some time. Uh, but if you can get somebody prepared and get them orientated first, it's going to be a lot more productive when the time comes to actually make those decisions. Um, as far as uh, parts, you know, there's t everything's moving nice and on an even keel, but when you're going through a transition, those parts have changed. Um, there's a transformation over time with people. Um, you know, every, I mean, I, I just recently lost my father. Um, my father had uh, Alzheimer's. I lived with that, and that, I went through that anticipation phase, and then the ending, and the passage, and went through all of those uh, stages. But your transformation um, for all of these things happens over time when you're going through a financial transition. An athlete who gets a huge contract and signing bonus is thinking about buying that big sports car and, and uh, how big his, po his or her posse is going to be. Um, somebody who uh, 
who gets a settlement, I mean, I often hear somebody wants to get a big truck or uh, they want to take their family. I had a breast cancer survivor wanted to take her entire family on a trip to Italy. Now, um, many times, uh, you know, people say these things and it's very easy to, to poo-poo what they're saying, but if you don't understand why it's important to them, uh, you're not going to be successful and these are the type of questions and, and getting to the bottom of why things are important to them is what we do and what, what makes us different than other people. I think the best way to uh, sum it up is at the bottom where it talks about being a painter versus an artist. The traditional financial advisor is a painter and the person who's a financial transitionist is a little bit more of an artist, a little more creative. Um, and I truly believe that somebody who needs to, who's going to be successful in this particular space, working with personal injury victims, air crash victims, wrongful death, um, anybody who is in a sudden money transition needs to have somebody who has transition expertise. This is just a, a list of all the services that we provide. And the point is not to tell you all the services we provide, but just to show you um, how we are marketing our services now. And that is, you'll see the, um, the core things that we do, structured settlements, wealth management, and trust advisory, but transitions leads the way. So when we, we talk to somebody about, we talk to somebody about what we do, we, we make it clear that our interest is getting to know them, what their needs are, what they want. Um, I'll tell you one of the key questions that I ask people now, um, especially you know older or people that have kids, and it's a very difficult question for people, but I always ask it. I ask them how they would like to be remembered. And you wouldn't believe how difficult that is for people uh, to answer. But when I, one of the things that I try to get people to do, um, you know, for, for example, somebody who's lost a spouse and they've got children, I, I have a very frank conversation with them and I ask them, how would you like to be remembered? You know, um, if somebody has died suddenly, they may or may not have made plans. Um, do you, do you want to have uh, somebody remember you a certain way? Do you want your kids or your, your other generations to, um, you know, to know about traditions within your family? Some of you may have read uh, a story, uh, I think it was in Texas, but there was a story recently about a, a woman who had passed away maybe two or three years ago, and she wrote two letters, one to, to be delivered to her, uh, to her, her husband, and the other to be delivered to her husband's new spouse. And it was a really, I mean, it was a real heartwarming story, uh, especially this, the, the letter to the, uh, the new spouse, which was basically, thank you, you're raising my kids, and you must be a very special lady type of thing. And uh, it, was it was really, really amazing. And that's an example of a legacy letter. And it's one of the, the things that we do as part of our, our financial planning process so that you know, if you're dealing with an air crash, for example, um, and somebody's you know, lost in, in the air crash, you know, who was that person? And maybe that gets the person, the survivors thinking about, you know, God forbid something like that, that, that happens to me suddenly, you know, how would I want to be remembered? So that's just examples of some of the things that we do, things that we do differently, and I, I just wanted to get across the concept of, of these transitions. When you have difficult clients, the reason why they're difficult is because they're going through transitions and they need to be uh, properly orientated and there's some transition work that needs to be done on a personal level. Uh, thank you. If anybody has any questions. Okay.